Take your Bibles and turn to the Matthew's Gospel. Matthew chapter number 24 is where we're going to start this morning. <clears throat> Several verses you can see there. I'm going to be in all of those areas. If you have bookmarks, you can, you can see the passages right now. But Matthew chapter 24 is where we're going to start. And I'm going to be skipping over a lot of things as we uh, touch on a message. Do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is speaking. He says, beginning verse number 3, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Verse 4, this is important. Pay attention to this verse. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. The Bible tells us that in the end times, there will be some things that will occur, obviously. One of those things is deception. And remember, whenever we think of church, I want to get this straight in your mind right in the beginning. Whenever we think of church, we're not thinking of this building. We're thinking of people. The Greek word is ekklesia. It means an assembly. And that's what's going on this morning. All over America, all over the world. But remember, it's referring to people. Buildings cannot be deceived. If God says deception is going to take place, that we need to be uh, aware of it, we need to be cautious about it, then we need to understand that it's actually going to happen. Not only is it going to happen, it has been happening. Deception and lying, when I was preparing for this message, I, I went, whatever, whatever usage of the term, found that, that well over 200 times in the Bible, we're, we're warned about lying, warned about deceivers, warned about deception. And so we need to be aware of this. Because, beloved, I believe that we are in the latter times. In fact, I know we are. We've been in the latter times since the ascension of Christ. But I believe that we are in the perilous last days of the latter times. That's my personal opinion. What, what you know, uh, someone asked one of my deacons here just recently, uh, so <clears throat> tell me, when is the rapture? Well, we don't know that. And by the way, if anybody tells you they do know that, run as fast as you can away from that person. Because only God knows when that's going to take place, and he has not revealed that to anybody. And so it could be today. It could be before this service is over. Uh, if it's not, it'll be tomorrow. If it's not tomorrow, it'll be the next day. It's imminent. There is not one other thing in the Bible that needs to be completed the very next thing on the prophetic calendar is the rapture of the church. That's it. So we're waiting for that. Why are we waiting for that? Because God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Many have already uh, decided not to have Christ, died and went to hell. But they, don't, they didn't have to. And nobody has to because you can make a decision to receive Christ as your personal Savior. And if you haven't done that today, I hope you'll do that today. But don't be deceived into thinking that you're A-OK -okay if you don't do that because you're in peril. You're in peril. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now turn over there if you would. 1 Timothy chapter number 4. <clears throat> and I'm going to be in 1 and 2 Timothy a lot today. So primarily that's, that's where you'll, uh, you'll be with me at. 1 Timothy chapter number 4, beginning in verse 1. The Word of God says, now the Spirit, you'll notice that's a capital S, that means it's a Holy Spirit. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. 
Verse 2, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. So you see the term being used the latter times, and it refers to, as I've already mentioned, the period of time from the ascension of Christ to this present moment. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, have your fingers there, by the way, in 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, the Bible also talks about this period of time, but, but, but condenses it down to this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Beloved, if you read the menu of things from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to about 5 or 6, you'll see a whole menu of behaviors and attitudes. All of those are prevalent today. Every single one of those. The sad thing is, it concludes by referencing the fact that the people that are doing those things have a form of godliness. Only a form, but deny the power thereof. Meaning, they're not saved. They have a form, they have a religion, they have a denomination, they have a following, but they're not truly born again. And so they're engaged in every one of those attitudes, and you can read those, but it's in the last days. And this is referring directly to the last days before the church is raptured out. The Bible says that some shall depart from the faith in 1 Timothy 4. Some shall depart from the faith. And there needs to be a greater understanding on what that means because we also know just absolutely uh, complete through the Bible, I mean extensively taught, that you cannot lose your salvation. You cannot, listen to me, this is common sense, but the Bible teaches it. You cannot lose what you did not deserve. Listen to me. Grace is unmerited favor. For, and and I'll, you'll, you'll see, uh, put it on the screen, fellas, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Look at it. For by grace are you saved through faith. For by grace are you saved. Say it with me. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. How could it be any more clear? How could it be any more clear? You see, God is faithful and you and I are not so faithful in a lot of areas. Faithful in some, not faithful in others. But God is faithful in everything. And God is faithful and by His loving grace He has extended a free gift of salvation. A free gift of salvation. And just like any gift, it has to be received. If you don't receive the gift, then you don't possess the gift. It doesn't come to you by osmosis. It doesn't come to you, John chapter 1. It doesn't come to you through the bloodline of your family. It doesn't become yours because mom was saved, dad was saved, granny was saved, grandpa was saved, down, down the line, ancestry.com. I mean, it, it doesn't matter what the ancestry was. It matters the decision that you have made personally. He is a personal Savior, okay? That's important. But the context, the con it says some shall depart from the faith. Pastor, doesn't that mean that they just walk away from their salvation? No, not at all. Because again, uh, you can be unfaithful, but God's going to stay true. The context of the warning is that there will be, if you notice, there will be heretical teachers who will deceptively mislead people to follow false doctrine. Read the context of the passage again. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines. It's talking about departing from faithful doctrine. 
speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. In other words, in the latter times, some are going to be deceived by deceivers, deceiving, seducing spirits. Basically, understand, God has, God has servants that he uses. Satan has servants that he uses, okay? They're going to be, they're going to be deceived by seducing spirits. It doesn't mean demon angels are going to come down and deceive them. It means that satanic influences in Satan's servants, they're going to be deceptive. They're going to be deceiving people. And, and they're going to be deceiving them to do what? To depart from the true teaching of God's holy word. The doctrine. This whole book is doctrine. Doctrine. That, that, that means, that means the, the teachings of God. And they're going to be deceived into departing from this to follow false doctrine. Now listen, think about your own experience. No doubt, if you've been saved for any length of time, then you know other Christians, obviously, because maybe you've been in a church for a long time. And you know Christians, I mean, you've known Christians, oh man, this person was really living for the Lord, this person was faithful, this person this, this person that. But then all of a sudden, something happened. We don't know necessarily always what happened. But something happened, and all of a sudden, this person, they're not faithful. They're not faithful anymore. All of a sudden, uh, you know, it starts out, I, I saw a sign one time that said, uh, uh, Christians are a lot like engines. They start, they start missing before they quit. Right. That's true about an engine, too. All of a sudden, they're, man, where's so-and-so been? Okay, well, then they show up. And then it's a little bit more of a time. Oh, and then they show up. But they're on their way to quit. And pretty soon they quit. And just about every Christian probably knows an experience like, has had an experience like that. With somebody that you knew. Somebody you loved. Somebody you cared about. Somebody you served with. Somebody you sat next to. You might even uh, talk to him. You might even went and saw him. You might, you, you, you know, what's going on? What, what's happened? What's this? What's that? What's the other thing? And problem is, is that some kind of deceiving influence. And by the way, Satan uses, Satan uses contrary, now listen to me, and don't be offended when I say this, but you know, the Bible says that, that our words matter, you know, that that our, that that good wholesome conversation is like apples of gold. And think about apples made out of solid gold. Wouldn't that? Wouldn't you like to have one of those? In pictures of silver. What a great picture! What a beautiful, beautiful picture. But God says that's the way that that our words ought to be. But Christians, sometimes that's not the case with us. Sometimes we get owly. I don't know why we pick on owls, but we get owly. I don't even know really what that means. Sometimes we just get bent out of shape. That's kind of weird too, isn't it? Sometimes we just get a bad attitude. I'm, I'm, I'm not over here convicting you. I'm just over here. And what happens is we bring that to church and then we end up saying something to somebody. And they shouldn't get offended. None of us should get offended. If you love that Bible, the Bible says in Psalm 119, 165, Great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing, nothing shall offend them. Why? Because dead people can't be offended. 
And a Christian, when they get saved, they're supposed to die to themselves. It's not about our flesh, it's about the Spirit. And so nothing, absolutely nothing, should offend you. Not at all. Not in any way, shape, or form. That is, if you love God's Word. Because you know what Jesus went through. And so, okay, that's, that's, that's fine. But what happens is we end up doing something or saying something to another fellow Christian. They get mad. Satan used that. They were immature. They got offended. Out the church they went. Now they're gone. Now they're gone. And and what was it all about? Huh? Are you? We're glad you're here. I don't normally do this, and when people come to my house, I do not say, talk about the rapture. So your message is dead on, so I don't know what God's doing, but I guess we're going to find out. <laughs> glad you're here, Jeff. Glad you're here. All right. Amen. I thought maybe God was going to call you to preach. <laughs> you see, God can use you to be friendly and influence, and Jeff, we're glad you're here. We're glad you're here. But, but also understand that if we don't keep our spirit right, we can end up Satan using us to, to blow somebody completely out. It's not to say that there isn't times when we all need to be corrected, because we're not perfect, okay? And, and listen, the, the Bible tells us very explicitly that the wounds of a friend are better than the kisses of an enemy. So sometimes, sometimes honestly, we do face those kinds of things, but, but listen... Most generally, we need to understand that, that what's going on in this passage of Scripture in Timothy is the fact that, that, that people have, for whatever reasons, departed from doing the true Word of God in their life. And they have been influenced, however to go and to go off into some area of false doctrine, false teaching, and there's a lot of that. There's a lot of that. Listen to me closely. True doctrine of grace salvation through faith can never be lost because it's not yours and mine. When David fell in sin, he didn't say, Lord, save me again. He said, restore unto me, Lord, the joy of thy salvation. Listen, Christian, when you're not living right for God, the Holy Spirit of God inside of you is grieved. And if the Holy Spirit of God inside of you is grieved, you don't feel like a, a well Christian. There's turmoil going on inside. The term that's used oftentimes, in the Bible, for those that depart, is apostasy. We know that. 
We saw it in, in Thessalonians talking about the rapture, talking about the coming of the Antichrist. The, the term apostasy is accurate. But what caused the apostasy? Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. Whatever those are out there, whatever individuals are being controlled by, by satanic influence, whatever they are, those are the instruments that are being used to seduce or to deceive others. Now look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 and 4 again. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables, not into. I've heard people read that wrong. It's unto fables. In other words, here's the time's going to come when they're just not going to endure a sound Bible teaching. They're not going to endure it. My good friend, who's with the Lord now, Dr. Earl Jessup, founder of, of Baptist uh, Church Planting Ministry, I, I, I tell you, he preached in this pulpit many times, and he called, prior to his death, he called what's happening in, in Christian, Christendom today <clears throat> is what he termed contemporary, which means new, contemporary fundamentalism. What that did was it identified a people who have departed, who have been deceived into leaving what they believed for a long, long time from the Bible. That's why God says in, 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 in 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Study the word of God. Study the word of God. That's not just a daily five-minute devotion. It is study to show yourself approved unto God. We've gotten away from that. Let's face it. Let's be honest. We've gotten away from that. And so what happens is we, we, we sometimes uh, end up departing because any old teaching comes along. Listen, every pastor, every pa I've been preaching for over 40 years. Every single pastor that I know, we've had these kind of conversations. Brother Randall, my people get preached to more in the week from radio preachers, TV preachers, whatever, than I get the opportunity to preach in church. And by the way, some churches are no more evening service. Some churches... No more midweek service. You know, in the first century church, they met together every day. And they didn't have a microwave. They didn't have washers and dryers. They, they didn't have automobiles to transport them. It was rather an inconvenient life. But somehow through it all, they lived, they ate, they worked, and they worshipped. And they did it every day. Now we are totally distracted and now churches are caving into it all, and, and it's going down. Many Protestant denominations have been one service a week for years and years and years and years and years. That'll happen here as soon as you get rid of Pastor Randall. But it, and I'm not patting myself on the back. It's just, I, I believe that we have made a mistake in Christianity where God says, remove, do not remove the ancient landmarks. Ask for the old paths, Jeremiah the prophet said, where is a good way. I'm an old paths guy. I believe in the landmarks. They're not moving. We're King James Bible and that's all we are. And that's all we'll ever be. If that doesn't suit anybody, I love you. There's a million churches out here that you can probably find home. 
But you know something? We're staying with the old paths. I even like the name of the group, the old paths. I like that. What am I, what am I saying? We don't need contemporary fundamentalism. We don't need anything new. We got it right here. We don't need to have an addendum to the Bible. We need to learn the Bible. Amen? There are people who have been deceived into walking away what, from what Jude uh, 3 uh, speaks of, the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. It was happening 2,000 years ago. What do you think it's doing in 2023? And what do they want? Well, the Bible tells us, doesn't it? You're right there in 2 Timothy chapter 4. After their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. I said a moment ago, I, I, was a, I, I, I played rock music for money. I never made the big time. Everybody that played for money always hoped to make it to the big time. We never did. Okay? There's a long story but let me just tell you this. <clears throat> when, the, when, the, when the doctrine of salvation came to this guy, God did some kind of transforming work in me. He saved my soul. The moment he did, the Holy Spirit of God came inside of me. Did I know that? No, I didn't know that. I didn't know the front of the Bible from the back of the Bible. If someone said, turn to Genesis, I would not be thumbing through the Bible. Where's Genesis? And the foggiest clue. But something happened to me. Something happened to me. And I, 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 I honestly, you know, I've got to tell you, it's the transforming work of God Almighty. And, and all of a sudden, man, my, my whole desires changed. What I see today in a lot of the contemporary, especially the mega churches, you got Johnny Spandex and the rubber bands are up here on the band, up there on the plant, uh, on the platform, and, and you got some guy, he's got his skinny jeans. And listen, if you've got skinny jeans, fine, wear them. But, but, you know, when I was a lost guy, when I was a lost kid and my dad was taking me to the Methodist church, my dad, I don't think my dad was, even, was, was saved even at that time. But there was a term that was used back then by all of society, <clears throat> and it was used by my dad a lot, and he'd say, he called me Bugs. Don't you dare call me Bugs. He called me Bugs. Bugs, get out your Sunday best. That was Saturday night. You're going to think I'm gross when I tell you this, but Saturday night was bath night in Montana. So we took a bath, and God said, Bugs, get out your Sunday best. I knew what that meant. I had a little suit. But it was the best. Why? Because God deserves the best. Oh, I know, yeah. God, God, yeah man looks on the outward appearance, and God looks at the heart. Yeah, I understand all that. But God still looks at the outward appearance too. I tell people, listen. Hey, just wear whatever you'd wear to your daughter's wedding. Why would you dress down for God? Now, listen, I'm not here to offend you. We don't have a dress code at Elmwood Baptist Church. And we never will have a dress code at Elmwood Baptist Church except for those that are serving in areas of ministry. Because Wendy's has a dress code. Burger King has a dress code. McDonald's has a dress code. The bank has a dress code. Why shouldn't the church look professional? I know you, you can't hardly handle the fact that this, the pastor of this church is so handsome. And now, honestly, I am hurt because they laughed about that. They really did. I, they laughed, but I didn't hear one amen. And I didn't even hear one amen. I didn't hear one amen from these guys right here. Yeah, the wounds of the friend. Listen, I need some kisses of an enemy.
the reason why those contemporary works are so appealing is because that's the kind of background a lot of people came out of. They, they came out of a rock and roll world, possibly. Okay? Oh, man, the church. Oh, the, the church is playing the music that I'm, that I'm used to. Oh, I, I really like that. You see, beloved, it's not about exciting our flesh. It's about submitting to our, the Spirit. That's what it's about. It's not about what we come to church to get. It is about what we come to church to experience and to give. That's why God says that, that we assemble ourselves to, uh, uh, together in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. We, we do that what, for what purpose? To encourage one another to love and to good works. Live stream, you can't do that. I'm sorry. You can hug your TV all you want. Your TV won't hug you back. Your TV won't pray with you. But every single service in this church, if you pay attention, you will see groups of people around, not cliques, I'm talking about groups of people around. Many times they're praying for one another. Many times, they're just encouraging someone. It's happening that way. It's the way it's supposed to be. We're not a perfect church. We're a very imperfect church. But that's the way it's supposed to be. I don't, I didn't want a religiousized version of Gary Randall on when I got saved, June 30th, 1977. I didn't need that. I didn't need that. A religiousized version of the old Gary Randall is a pile of junk. A hardcore drug addict, rock musician who needed to have a transformed life. I am the least likely guy to have ever ended up in the pulpit. But God chose the base things. Read 1 Corinthians. Read 2 Corinthians. God, doesn't, God chooses sometimes the least likely guy to ever. And that's me. And you're stuck with me. What are they, what are they wanting after their own lusts? I've followed up calls with people who have come looking for a church and I've gone over the years, over the many years and I've, I've, I've sat down and talked with them and in recent years it used to be in the beginning of the ministry it used to be I'd, I'd come in and, and people would say, Jeff, people would ask questions, biblical questions now I, I follow up with some people the very first question I get asked is what kind of music do you guys have? Okay, well, not that that isn't important, but don't you want to know what Bible we use? Uh, don't, you know, don't you want to know what we believe about salvation? Don't you want to know what we believe about uh, consecration and, and living for God? Don't you, don't you want to know about any of that? Very little of that today. Why? After their own lusts. They heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Give me a preacher who's not going to preach. By, by the way, the term preach has now become an anathema. Don't preach to me. Wait a minute. The Bible says that Jesus went preaching everywhere. What are you telling Jesus not to preach? Jesus told me to preach. God, Jesus called me to preach. The pulpit in the contemporary church is a sounding board that is merely saying back to the people what they want to hear. You'll never be helped that way. We will never grow that way. 
It's a form of self-deception. If the people desire a calf to worship, guess what? A ministerial calf maker is easily found. They're all over the place. Go worship. Having itching ears. Some come to hear, some come to learn. Some come to hear and not to learn. It's a picture of our day. They don't go to church to hear sound doctrine, many of them. They want to be entertained. That's not what we come to church for. There's other ways to be entertained. The preacher who preaches the Bible is often rejected. I'm not the most popular guy. I'm not trying to be. I'm trying to serve God. I'm trying to serve in the world that's actually even probably worse today than it was when the crowd cried out, Crucify Him! Crucify Him! Wait a minute. Isn't this the guy that fed you? Isn't this the guy who healed you? Isn't this the guy who did miracles with you? Crucify Him! You see, society's always been fickle. Changing. 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 God says we're not to be given to change. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Think differently. How do I do that? I pour this in and the junk comes out. Transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How many Christians can stand up and say, I know exactly what God's will for my life is. At this moment in my life, I know exactly what God's will for my life is. Do you know there probably wouldn't be one Christian in ten that could ever stand up and say that? I, I hope I'm wrong. But we, we, want, we want entertainment. We don't want the Bible. Charles Spurgeon said over a hundred years ago, he said, a time will come when instead of shepherds feeding the sheep, the church will have clowns entertaining the goats. Over a hundred years ago, he said that. Pretty prophetic, huh? In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 and 4, the Bible says, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. They don't want to hear it. Listen, don't talk to me about that. Don't talk to me about that. I don't want to hear that. Okay. Itching ears become deaf ears. Dr. J. Vernon McGee once said, if I teach the book of Revelation, I can fill the church even during the midweek service. But if I teach the epistle to the Romans, I can practically empty this church out. And he had a big church. He had a big church. He concluded by saying, there are a great many people who are more interested in the Antichrist than they are in Christ. Now look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. I'm going to get you out of here, I promise. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Verse 2 is, is critical. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. First of all, notice doctrines of devils. It's doctrine that we're talking about here. They're, they're, they're being seduced into another form of doctrine. People are going to be deceived. Demons that control others are, are deceptive. Christians are told in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, listen to this. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits. Try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. That was 2,000 years ago. What do you think it's like today? The test, the test that we should apply is found, you got your Bibles open to 1 Timothy Chapter 3, verse 16 now. 
And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. He was revealed in the form of his son. Justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. That's the test. The only way that you can be saved is through the death and shed blood of Christ. That's the only way. You can't get saved any other way. You can't get saved in baptism. You can't get saved in communion. You can't get saved in good works. You can't get saved any other way. And if someone says differently, they are a deceiver. And you need to not be deceived. 1 Timothy chapter 4, 2 says, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. There are those who were never saved to begin with, who hypocritically pretended to be saved. They weren't really saved. Listen, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. It's a present active participle in the Greek. It really... It really, if you were going to translate it in the Greek, it would say, old things are passing away. Behold, all things are becoming new. See, the old life goes away. We put off the old life, and we put on the new life. Are you following me? Yes. There, are, there are people who pretend to be saved. They're not really saved. The, the tree doesn't have any fruit of genuine salvation. Having their conscience seared with a hot iron. In other words, their, brain, their conscience has been cauterized to where they don't feel bad about lying. They don't feel bad about it. They don't feel bad about being a deceiver. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, it says, Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Faith that is not faked. The things which characterize a true believer are things that are evident in your life. Faith, love, good conscience. The fruits of the Spirit found in Galatians 5. So this deception, I've, I've told you today, do not be deceived. So this deception can come one of two ways. It can come even both ways. Uh, the, the, the first is from the outside. The devil is a master at deceiving from the outside. He uses his servants to do that and things. And there's another way. And that is I can be deceived, number one. I can deceive, I, you can deceive yourself spiritually. Now, turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. And look at verse 18 and 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning verse 18. The Word of God says, Let no man deceive himself. Do you notice that? Do you see that? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he taketh the wise, notice, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. Have you ever told yourself a lie and then talked yourself into believing it? Now I could give you some examples today, but I'm afraid that I really would offend somebody. And that's not my intention today. But when you, when you tell yourself something that isn't true and then say, you know, but I, you know, I'm going to do that anyway, you have just entered into self-deception. That's very dangerous. Let me ask you this. Have you ever seen a friend do something wrong? You knew it was wrong, but you went along with it? That, by the way, is another form of self-deception. We should never go along with wrong. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, let no man deceive himself. It, it, every one of us in this room can deceive ourselves spiritually. How? 
because our heart is wicked. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. Look at the verse. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? It scares me when I hear people say, Christian people say, well, you know, I just know in my heart that, well, so-and-so has just got a good heart. They obviously haven't read the Bible. Because your heart is not good. It is deceitful and desperately wicked. And it needs to be under the control of the Holy Spirit of God. Is our heart more deceitful than the devil? Yes, it is. Because, again, the verse, read the words. The heart is deceitful above all things. It is more deceitful than the devil. So, here's an example. Suppose you commit a terrible sin. And here's what some Christians will say. Uh, they've done something just horrible in their minds and, and they say, God will never forgive me. People have said that. I've heard people say that. I've had people say to me, God cannot forgive me, Pastor Randall, because I've done too many terrible things in my life. Baloney! That is self-deception. Because Jesus will forgive every single sin you've ever done. Paul the Apostle was a mass murderer. There is nothing that you and I have done. Nothing that you and I have done. Nothing that you and I have done that Jesus Christ did not die for. Another self-deception is I'm saved because I belong to a certain church or a certain denomination. Baloney. I'll give you $10,000 today if you can show that to me in the Bible. That is self-deception. You must make an individual decision for Christ. Mama can't do that for you. Daddy can't do that for you. Nobody can do that for you. Pastor can't save you. You have to do that. That's self-deception. Secondly, worldly education neglects the Word of God. Do not be deceived about this. Do not be deceived about this. It is actually a fact that the more worldly education a person gets, the tendency is to walk away from the doctrines of the Lord. Back in the 1700s, I'll, I'll quickly do this because I know I'm running late. Back in the 1700s, in the start of the public school system in America, the Bible was the primary textbook. It was the very first textbook in the public schools. By the way, all the copies, $300,000 was spent in the 1700s to buy Bibles for all the schools in this newfound nation. But listen to me. <laughs> now you fast forward to 2023, mankind has become much more educated. There's no doubt about that. No question that mankind is smarter today, I think, than they were in the 1700s, of course. But guess what else happened? You can't bring a Bible to a public school anymore. You can't do that. The very first book is not allowed anymore. Man got smarter, the book got thrown out. There's no denying that education is important. But what happens is, if it's the wrong education, it ends up tossing the Bible. 2 Timothy 3, 7, ever learning, the Bible said, oh, that, this, is one of the, this is one of the hallmarks of the last days. One of the hallmarks of the last days. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Constantly going to school. Oh, I'm going to the university. Oh, I'm going to this college. Oh, I'm doing this thing. Thirdly, I just want you to know, and I'm ending the message, God wins. I don't care. Listen, the world can do whatever the world's going to do. People can think whatever they're going to think. Let me tell you something. In the end, God wins. Don't be deceived about it. 1 Corinthians 3.19, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, He taketh the wise 
in their own craftiness. Oh, they think they're so wise. Oh, they think they got it. Oh, I'm pulling the wool over God's eyes. Oh, I'm going to have my way. No, you're not. God says, I win. I win in the end. In the end, everybody will stand before God, lost and saved. James chapter 1, verse 22, I'm closing with this verse. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. We've gotten to, our, we've gotten to a place, Pastor, Chris, Pastor Chris's heart on, on this matter is, is, is right. It's not wicked, and it's not deceitful. It's right on this matter. We all need to be doing the word of God. And if we don't step up to do the word of God, we're deceiving ourselves. We're telling ourselves, I'm a good Christian. I'm a good Christian. Guess what? You're the only one saying it. Because God ain't saying it. God says if we don't do the word, if we just hear the word, it's like a sponge. Ladies, you know how this works. Listen, once the sponge is full of water, is it any more useful? Nope. No, I mean, you slosh it around, make a big mess. But once the sponge is full, it's worthless. A Christian who hears, 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 hears like a sponge. But if that, listen, Christian, if you don't get squeezed out in doing something for God, you're worthless. Worthless. I'm not trying to offend you. I'm just saying. There is in every single Bible preaching church that I know of, there is something for every single person to do. Servants don't choose where they serve. They pray and say, God, how can I serve you? That's servant. Father,